Jeez, huh? You look like you've just been dumped. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 times that 70s show got serious. My mom's flying home from the Fiesta de las Margaritas, so I guess it's pretty serious. Mm. <laughs> wow, that is serious. Playboy voted Fiesta de las Margaritas Latin America's number one singles party. For this list, we'll be looking at the scenes and storylines that were the most serious on the sitcom That 70s Show. If there's a moment from the series that bummed you out, and you're bummed it didn't make our list, let us know in the comments. Number 20. Kitty's Mother Cries Kitty's parents, Bee and Bert, visit the foremans. Bee is quite overbearing, frequently berating her husband. Tragically, during their visit, Bert passes away. How you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Mom, your husband, my father, is gone. You're not fine. You're right. I think I chipped a tooth on your manicotti. <laughs> <laughs> when I die, get a caterer. Kitty takes it hard, and she's disturbed by her mother's apparent lack of grief. However, when Kitty goes to confront her about it, she finds her mother crying quietly in her room. What is it? I, um, just wanted to see if you wanted another blanket. Yes, that would be very nice. Thank you. It's a really heartfelt, somber moment, and a reminder that everyone grieves in different ways. Losing a spouse after you've been together for so long is an incredibly difficult thing to endure. And, honestly, seeing Betty White crying automatically has us in tears, even if she's only acting. Number 19. Red and Eric Go Drinking Red Foreman is rarely a tactful father, particularly towards Eric. That's why it's hardly surprising that he has a difficult time relating to Eric's depression after his son breaks up with Donna. All that's left is this big hole, you know? Uh, no, I don't. Oh! <laughs> but there is a gopher hole out back. And if you shove the holes down and flush him out, I'll stand at the other end and hit him in the head with a shovel. When his usual yelling proves unable to motivate Eric, Kitty reminds Red of his first breakup with a girl. Oh, Eloise. Oh, Eloise. <laughs> While seeing a young Red is nothing short of amazing, it also prompts the character to console his son. Did you cry? No. <laughs> no, no. But there were times when I thought I would never get over it. It's a rare moment of understanding between father and son, and also makes for a special moment in the show as a whole. Number 18. Jackie's father is arrested. Jackie's dad is one of the most seldom seen of the parental characters in the series. His role is largely to provide his spoiled daughter with a lavish lifestyle. However, in this episode, it's revealed that Jack Burkhardt took bribes in his job as a city councilman, and he's sent to prison. But mom, dad's in trouble, so I really think he needs to come back from Acapulco now. Uh-huh. Wow, that is a lot of tequila. Jackie is distraught, particularly with her mom being equally absent, and she looks to the foremans and hide for comfort. You are so full of it. All I'm asking for is a gesture, and you can't even do that. <sighs> Okay, I got something. Get your dad a carton of cigarettes. So he can trade them. Although the show does play some parts of the situation for laughs, the loss of a parent in this way is still a very upsetting and all too real situation. Number 17. Eric leaves. Eric and Donna both have worries about their future after they're engaged to be married during high school. Are you having doubts about me? Because if you are, tell me now. Eric gets cold feet after a dream he has about their future together. Although Donna also has second thoughts too, she does show up to the rehearsal dinner, but Eric does not. Eric eventually returns to explain himself fully to Donna, and while she agrees that they may have dodged a bullet by not getting married so young, his lack of communication was not okay. It's an essential part of any successful relationship, and his inept skills in that department was probably a good indicator that he wasn't ready for a commitment as major as marriage. Please forgive me. I don't know. I mean, my mom said I should, but... <laughs> I don't know. Number 16. Red is laid off. Red works for many years at an auto parts plant. 
However, throughout the first season, his hours are gradually cut back. Finally, in season two, he and many of his co-workers are laid off when the plant closes down. He joins them in getting drunk at a bar. How am I going to support my family? Ah, the hell with it. <laughs> at least I got you guys. <laughs> no, I love you guys. <laughs> While seeing Red loosen up is fun, particularly after he convinces Eric and his friends to join him, the events themselves are no laughing matter. Then Kitty shows up and tries to console Red, claiming they've been through worse. But Red can't remember any examples, and neither can she. Are you worried? <sighs> nah, I'm not worried, Kitty. I'm too drunk to be worried. Losing your job and being uncertain if you'll be able to support your family, that's heavy stuff. Number 15. Eric tells Red off. After she's late, Kitty believes she's pregnant. I'm eating for two now. What? what? I'm pregnant! <laughs> oh, God, no! I mean... Great! Faced with the prospect of having a child at a later age than most, she's understandably nervous. And when Red drops the ball on supporting her, Eric steps in to set him straight. His mom is really scared. And she could really use a little damn support right now. And I, I don't usually tell you what to do, because you usually do the right thing. But this time, you didn't. You know how you're always telling me to be a man? Well, be a man! He's the one who yells at Red for once, telling him that he needs to be there for Kitty through what is a very scary time for her. Luckily, it gets through to his dad because he later gets out the old crib and decides to sell his Corvette. That is so sweet. Yeah, well, might be fun. Hell, this time we might even get an athlete. Kitty's lateness is revealed to be a result of menopause in the following episode, but for the time when they thought it was pregnancy, Red put his family first. Number 14. It's better to have loved and lost. Remember your first heartache? Wasn't it just the worst? If you're anything like Eric, you might have even wondered if it was worth it for all the pain you now feel. Heck, you might even have wished you'd never fallen in love in the first place. Who are you? Let's go. Go where? Well, you said you wished that you'd never kissed her. I can show you what would have happened if you never did. In this It's a Wonderful Life parody, an angel shows Eric how his life might have turned out had he and Donna never kissed. And it ain't pretty. Idiot. You're sad you were never with Donna? Well, you got off light, man. I had her and I lost her. And believe me, you don't want to know how bad that hurts. Even so, Eric chooses to wipe his memory off their time together. Luckily, he has a change of heart in the nick of time. Wait, no. I want to keep it. Please, just let me keep it. Ultimately, he realizes that even though it hurts a lot now, it is better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. Number 13, second choice. After Eric and Donna break up, she gets involved with Kelso's brother, Casey. However, the guy is a massive tool and ends up getting her drunk during a school day and then not standing up for their relationship. Casey, I thought you said you You know, you said you loved me. Yeah. I have this thing where I say stuff I don't really mean. After they break up, Donna turns to Eric, who comforts her. The conversation is an absolute gut punch. I'm so sorry. Hey. I'm so stupid. In her vulnerable state, Donna kisses Eric, wanting to get back together. However, Eric refuses to be her second choice. Donna claims this isn't the case, and Laura Prepon's delivery breaks us every time. Donna, I can't be your second choice. <laughs> but you're not! If we could reach into our screens and give them both a hug, we wouldn't hesitate for a second. Number 12. Kelso struggles with responsibility. When Kelso discovers that Brooke, a girl he had a one-night stand with, is pregnant, he's expectedly freaked out. However, Brooke lets him know that she doesn't expect him to be involved. You don't have to think about this ever again. And I won't. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're like the coolest girl I ever did it with at a concert. Kelso is relieved about this at first, but his conscience and his friends have other ideas. Hyde especially has an issue with it, given his own absent father. 
Still, Kelso makes a surprisingly good rebuttal. You know what? It's really easy to talk about the right thing to do when it's not your life. He does eventually decide to be involved in his child's life, even if Brooke still needs more convincing. Look, you can try to get rid of me, but I'm not walking away from this. I'm sorry. I just don't want you to be the father of my child. Teenage pregnancies are frequent enough in real life, and the show manages to make one of its goofiest characters take the topic seriously. Number 11. Bad Blood Kitty takes Eric to the hospital where she works as a nurse for career day. Eric gets to see a whole different side of his mother, and certainly gains a new respect for her as she helps keep the doctors from accidentally killing the patients. Uh, Mr. Harris is allergic to penicillin, and I thought erythromycin might make him a touch less dead. <laughs> I know that when I go to the hospital, I like to not die. Unfortunately, one of her patients, Mr. Anderson, passes away. Eric is baffled at his mother's ability to deal with death, questioning her about it as she sings along to Bad Blood by Neil Sedaka. But as she continues singing and he joins in, it becomes clear this is how she processes it all. Number 10. Kelso breaks up with Jackie. And you said that I'd never be able to support you because I wasn't smart enough. And you're always putting me down like that. And it makes me feel bad about myself. Michael Kelso and Jackie Burkhart have one of the most tumultuous relationships on that 70s show. Whilst they've broken up and gotten back together multiple times, and although it was tempting to choose when Jackie broke up with Kelso, the inverse is arguably more serious. When the couple is arguing over their respective cheating, Kelso shows up to Jackie's room and tells her that he's realized that he was unfaithful because Jackie puts him down so much. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Just like that. He goes on to decide that they should break up because he can't be with someone who makes him feel bad about himself. Michael, what are you saying? I'm saying that we're not right for each other because you make me feel bad. Kelso may be an idiot, but even he can see that he deserves someone who will lift him up instead. Number 9. Jackie says, I don't love you. The thing is, I'm really sorry. Yeah, you said that already. Speaking of Jackie's relationships, her time with Stephen Hyde isn't free of heartbreak either. After Hyde catches Jackie apparently in Kelso's arms, he sleeps with someone else. Although he does admit this to her, Jackie breaks up with him. This scene alone is a real gut punch, but the follow-up hits even harder. God, just do me a favor and leave me alone. Whatever. After trying to apologize again, Hyde admits that he loves Jackie. While it clearly affects her, she doubles down and tells him she doesn't love him back. Jackie. I love you. Yeah, well, I don't love you. Number 8. Bob accepts Midge is gone. Went out and got these chocolates. I hope she likes them. I guess we'll find out when she comes back, huh? <laughs> Bob Pinciati, Donna's dad, is kind of a goofy, lovable doofus. However, even he gets a serious storyline. When his wife Midge finally leaves him, Bob is unable to accept it. He remains in denial, making remarks throughout the episode about her coming back, even buying her gifts. Ultimately, it falls to Red Foreman to set him straight. These chocolates are for Midge, Bob. They're for Midge. Fine. Let's give them to Midge. Here you go, Midge. Although Bob is at first sure it's just his neighbor being mean as usual, he eventually says that he knows Midge isn't coming back. She's not coming back, is she? Spousal and parental abandonment isn't something sitcoms usually tackle, but that 70s show deals with it gracefully. Speaking of which, number seven, Red hugs Hyde. Hyde hasn't had the greatest family life, so when his dad Bud shows up again after years of absence, tensions are certainly high. Wow, Bud, doing great now, huh? Color TV? I remember when I was a kid, I didn't even have a father. While Kitty tries to get them to get along, Red is more critical, particularly when he sees Hyde hand money over to Bud to help him with rent. Oh. Crap. While Red is ready to lecture Hyde about it, Hyde tells him he's decided to move in again with Bud. 
After all, he's family. Stephen, your dad is not... Good. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, you know, he's my dad. Red holds back and instead wishes him luck. He continues playing tough, but it's clear he's come to see Hyde like a son. That Red tells Hyde he's not going to hug him and then hugs him anyway is just heartwarming. So what? Uh, you don't want a hug, do you? <laughs> God, no. Good. Because you're not getting one. <laughs> Number 6. Eric has to stay After Red has a heart attack, he can't support his family the way he used to. With Eric poised to leave for college, Kitty must work more shifts to make ends meet. Oh God, I'm late for work. What, you're working tonight? Well honey, nights can be our busiest time. Lots of people stroke out after a big salty dinner. <laughs> Eric is sure his parents are trying to guilt him into staying. Down in the basement, he vents to Donna, becoming increasingly emotional as he yells about how much he needs to leave. They can't do this to me. They cannot do this to me. I gotta get out of here. Of all the people in the history of the world that have ever had to get anywhere, it is me having to get the hell out of here! I have to go! But ultimately, he decides he needs to stay to help his family. I have to stay. Overwhelmed that he's given up his dreams, he just wants to hold Donna. The scene runs the gamut of emotions and Topher Grace absolutely kills it. I think I know something that might make you feel better. Hey, um, could we just like, could we just sit for a while? Number five, Fez experiences racism. It's a big deal when Fez meets his girlfriend Nina's parents. Nina was reluctant to introduce him to them and it turns out she had good reason. Although they initially seem enthusiastic, this changes when they realize that she and Fez are dating and not just friends. Oh, you can't be her boyfriend. Why not? Because you're, uh, what's the word, honey? Uh, different. Okay, different. <laughs> oh, I see. Their overt racism during dinner leads to Fez briefly breaking up with Nina until she tells him she doesn't share their ignorant views. Nina, a relationship is over. My self-respect demands it, and there's nothing you can say to make me change my mind. Fez, my parents are jerks, and I want to get back at them by doing it with you on their bed. <laughs> Although Fez isn't treated with much cultural sensitivity through most of the show, particularly by Red, few of his friends are malicious in how they treat him, which makes this a difficult watch. Number four, the foremans take Hyde in. Steven, why don't you go to your room and gather some clothes, and I'll do a load of wash for you at our house. Cool. We've touched on Hyde's abandonment issues before, and as serious as his tense reunion with his dad is, we'd like to touch on the other half of that unfortunate equation, his mum. Midway through the show's first season, Edna Hyde abandons her son. When Red and Kitty go to Hyde's house and see how he's been living, it's pretty tragic. You need a coffee table. <laughs> yeah, that'd really pull the room together. <laughs> Kitty is of course ready to adopt Stephen immediately, but Red doesn't know how they can afford to support another kid. Well, I suppose we could call social services. Yeah, see, now that's sensible. Yeah, they'll know what to do. Yes. You know, after all, they take thousands of cases every year. So many, in fact, that they have to house them in gymnasiums. <laughs> Although his profanity-strewn decision to let Hyde stay with them is hilarious, Hyde being essentially orphaned is still a very real subject to cover. Stephen, you get your together and you get your ass in the damn car. We're going. Number three, grieving for grandma. I don't think being nice for a whole day would kill you. <laughs> That 70s show has dealt with grief and death in several episodes. And what the hell was going through your head when you did that? Oh, just yell at him, Red. I'm sure that his grandmother dying hasn't upset him enough. Each of the foremans processed the death of Red's mother in different ways. Well, you know, busy hands are happy hands. <laughs> oh, say, would you like a cup of chili with your waffles? Kitty makes too much food, Eric lashes out, and Red bottles up and turns wistful. You know, she was the first one to call me Red. And the last time I saw her, I didn't, I didn't say I love you. 
I didn't even say goodbye. Red sharing the things he loved about his mom with Eric is so special and uncharacteristically emotional for him, while Red's reaction to Eric's last words to his grandmother gives both him and us a laugh. Kitty's breakdown soon after has us fighting off the waterworks again. Number 2. Eric and Donna break up We're together now. Isn't that enough? No! Let's be clear, if this were purely a list of the saddest moments in that 70s show, this could easily be number one. After Eric gets Donna a promise ring, it brings up questions for her about their future. She wants to give the ring back, claiming that if they're meant to be, they're meant to be, and a ring isn't going to make it any more likely. Eric argues that commitment to each other, like with the ring, is how they'll be together in the future. If you can see a future for yourself without me, and that doesn't like break your heart, then I, I, we're not doing what I thought we were doing here, and you know what? Maybe we shouldn't even be together at all. We can see where they both are coming from, but it doesn't mean it's any less heartbreaking when Eric suggests they break up. Are you breaking up with me? Well, are you giving back that ring? Yes. Then... Yes. So often in sitcoms, breakups can feel staged, but this feels all too real. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Red and Eric's Hunting Talk You know, I was hoping that this trip would be better than the last, where you cried about every stupid thing. <laughs> I was six. Red and Eric Foreman don't exactly have the most loving father-son relationship. Threats and insults on Red's side and sarcasm on Eric's part tend to be the order of the day. Boy, it was right around 13 when you started getting a little lippy. <laughs> when the guys go hunting and the two of them are alone in a deer blind, a lot of their issues come up. Red eventually asks Eric to tell him what he thinks of him. Eric replies that he believes Red feels pushed around by life and that by being hard on his son, that Eric will have fewer difficulties later in life like he has. I think you're angry because life didn't turn out exactly the way you wanted it to. And uh, maybe you think if you yell at me, I won't let life push me around too. It's a rare moment of honesty between them and it helps their dynamic feel very authentic and somehow just as loving as their rare moments of affection. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.